السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته. ما شاء الله الله بلس يا رب. I I notice you've been sitting for a while and uh, I do this for a living so I know uh, what happens. Um, can I ask everyone to just kindly stand up for me for a second? Just just stand up a second. Don't be shy. Just stand up and shout. And what I'm going to do, right, is I'm going to say takbir, and you will say Allahu Akbar, but this time you will kind of, you know, yeah, like with a fist. And do it three times. All right? And obviously I'm looking out for quality, so if it's bad, we keep going. So takbir. I said three times, so you go three times. All right, takbir. MashaAllah. Please take a seat, ladies and gentlemen. MashaAllah. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah al Azim al Khabir al Muta'ali. Alhamdulillah al Ladi la tuhjibuhu bulumat al Layali. الحمد لله الذي أرسل الجبال العوالي سبحانه من إله عظيم يغفر الذنوب ولا يبالي لا إله إلا الله بها نحيا وبها نموت وبها نلقى الله وبها نوالي وأشهد أن عظيمنا وقدوتنا ومولانا قرة عيني محمد ابن عبد الله عبده ورسوله وصفيه من خلقه وخليله أرسله كافة للناس بشيرا ونذيرا وداعيا إلى الله بإذنه وسراجا منيرا فبلغ الرسالة وأدى الأمانة ونصح الأمة فكشف الله به الغمة وجاهد في الله حق جهاده حتى أتاه اليقين فصلوات ربي وسلامه عليك يا سيدي يا رسول الله My beloved brethren, most respected elders, mothers and sisters To understand a prophecy adequately You need to go slightly deeper so prophecies are things that the Prophet ﷺ told about the future. To get the understanding that the Allah in His Prophet wanted you to understand, you got to do a bit of research. So the prophecies allocated to me are prophecies on the women, as in sayings of the Prophet Sayings of the Prophet with regards to challenges which will face womankind at the end of time. To understand it, you kind of need to understand the context from which the Rasul was speaking. And to understand the context of that, you need to go before the time of the Rasul. You with me? That sounded convincing. You with me? All right. So when the Rasul came, or before the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, let's do a quick analysis. In Arabia, in the peninsula, when young girls were born, so when someone came and told the father, "You've been." You know, you've just had a female child born to you, as in to your wife. His face used to go dark and shame and anger. And then he used to contemplate, how do I rid myself of this musibah? And for some of them it was instantaneous, for some after some time, but they used to, and for some they didn't do it, true, but many of them would go and dig a hole and bury the child alive. So this was the situation of women in Arabia. And if you leave 
the Arab Peninsula and go to the subcontinent of India, there womankind had other challenges. Traditionally in Indian culture, and I don't mean Bollywood of today, I mean India. In India, all the men used to marry younger girls. So by default, naturally, it could be anticipated that the man would die first. And yet when she died, the culture and the religion required, because the Hindus burn their dead alive, I mean burn their dead after after they're dead. So when he used to die, the culture required that that young girl be burnt alive with his corpse. So they used to make the firewood. She used to be made to sit on top of it. And then the fire used to be lit. And you can naturally imagine that when there's fire under you, you'll jump. You'll run, you'll scream. So they used to get these long sticks and hold her down from afar. The practice is called sati. It was there even when the British went there in India. When they colonized India, it was there. And they made it illegal after some time, as in the Britain, the British. So that was the situation of women in the subcontinent. And if you left the subcontinent and move a little that way towards Persia, where our background is, there the king was in the process of marrying his own sister so that he could have purebred royal children. And you might think, Ustaz, let's go to the enlightened Europe. In Europe, they didn't consider women to be human. And then later they said, the church, the Catholic church, that she is human, but defected, and that she is inevitably evil. She has Eve in her, as in Mother Eve, who took man out of the favor of God, made him eat from the forbidden tree. And in case you're wondering what about our cousins, the Jews, even t today, the Orthodox Jew gets up every morning and makes this dua. Blessed be God, Lord of the universe, that thou hast not made me a woman. Thank you, Ya Rab, for not making me a woman. And the girl gets up and says, Blessed be God for making me in accordance to his will. So you understand that she was downtrodden, oppressed, killed, buried alive, burnt alive. Do you understand that the world was not a good place for women at that time? And I don't want you to think this was unanimous. There were certain women who came out of this oppression, strong-willed people who faced, you know, the, um, the difficulties of society and the difficulties of, the, you know, the world of their time. And, uh, and one of them is uh, Hind, the, the wife of Abu Sufyan, you know, and you read, the poem that she says um, in the Battle of Uhud, نحن بنات طارق نمشي على النمارق إن تقبلوا نعانق أو تدبروا نفارق We are the daughters of Tariq used to walking on cushions. So they were, but these were an immensely acute minority. Most of them, most of women were bearing the brunt of oppression. Some because they were blamed. 
for committing the original sin, as was the Jewish and Christian scriptures. Others, because they brought them shame or poverty. Others, for, um, you know, an array of reasons. And in this climate Islam camp, Allah honored the world with Islam. And one of the first revelations of the Prophet that Allah Rabbul Izzah revealed to the Prophet is the verses وَإِذَا الْمَوْؤُودَةُ سُئِلَتْ And on the day of judgment when that infant girl will be asked بِأَيِّ ذَنْبٍ قُتِلَتْ For what sin were you killed? Or when the little babe asks in the day of judgment Father, for what sin did you kill me? Establishing that in this deen of Muhammad, this is haram. At the days where he was finding his own survival difficult, he was preaching the emancipation of womankind. Let the poor girl live. And not only that, Islam called the news of a female birth Glad tidings. قَالَ تَعَالَى وَإِذَا بُشِرَ أَحَدُهُمْ بِالْأُنْثَى When they are given the good news, the glad tidings of a female birth. And Allah Rabbul الْعِزَّةِ called the female child a gift of God. وَهَبَ لِمَنْ يَشَاءُ أُنَاثَى Allah gifts whomever He chooses women, as in girls, as in, babe, as in children who are girls or females, and gifts whomsoever He chooses with male offsprings. Do you see that this, the deen of Muhammad, initially women are very downtrodden, now the deen lifted them up. So the deen reigned supreme. In 23 years, the whole of the Jazeera fell to Islam. So what type of culture do you think this new country and this new religion and this new system had? This system considered the birth of a female child a gift of God. It considered the news of her birth glad tidings. When she was a girl, and in your house, as in your her father, the Prophet said, if you bring three girls up and manner them and teach them till they reach independence or they move to their, to their husband's houses, you will be resurrected next to me like this in Jannah. So the Sahaba said, you know, he's, I don't have three daughters, you know, this is not my calling. What about two, O Prophet? So he said, whoever has two daughters and brings them up, as in teaches them and prepares them until they reach independence and go into their husband's houses, will be resurrected next to me like this in Jannah. And the Ashab say, had we were to ask for one, he would have said the same. So now this new nation, the Muslim nation, was looking at women and at young daughters with an eye of respect. She's the gift of God. She is my salvation in the Akhirah. In another hadith in the Sahihain, the Prophet ﷺ says, whoever brings up daughters and cherishes them and nourishes them and maintains them and till they reach, you know, an age of independence, they will be sufficient a uh, protection for him from the fire. So do you want to see the product of this new society who yesterday hated womankind, now they ask the leader of this organization and this religion, Muhammad Mustafa, Man ahabbu nasi ilayka ya Rasool Allah. O Prophet of Allah, who is the most beloved of humankind to you? Who do you love the most, Ya Rasul? And one of these narrations is from Amr ibn al-As. And the scholars say he was sitting in front of the Rasul. 
and the attention the Prophet used to give each individual person, they used to feel like I am the most beloved person to him. So wanting to establish this, you know, Amr, that I am the most beloved to the Prophet, he asked him, who is the most beloved of people to you? So the Prophet said, Aisha, my wife is the most beloved person to me. So Amr says, Min al-Rijal, from the men of oh Prophet Khalas, you love her, from the men who do you love? Because he's hoping it's him, because of... So, the Prophet said, Abuha, her father, Abu Bakr, do you see? That's her as a wife. Then as a mother, the, the Sahabi came to the Prophet wasallam. who is the most deserving of my friendship and companionship? He said, your mother. The cousin of the Prophet Ibn Abbas, a man came to him, I have committed murder. Is there any way out for me? Forgiveness in the court of Allah. He said, do you have a mother? So his student said, Ya Ibn Abbas, we don't see the link. What does the mother have to do with, with his case of murder? He said, I don't know a path more direct to Jannah than servitude to the mother. I don't know a more easier path and direct path and faster path and shorter cut to the pleasure of Allah than to serve the mother. So in this nation of Muhammad alayhi afdalu salatu wa atammu taslim, the one that was buried yesterday became the gift of God. And imagine Hajj comes. What is the product of this nation? The man has his mother on his back. On his back. For those of you that have been to Hajj, Hajj is a difficult exercise. And he has her on his back, on his shoulders, and is doing the tawaf. Proud and happy that I am serving on my old mother. And the pleasure of God is in this, and the pleasure of the Prophet is in this. And so happy he is in this act that he looks at Ibn Umar. Ya Ibn Umar. Have I repaid the kindness of my mother? I have served. I am carrying her doing the rounds of tawaf. Have I served? Have I repaid her kindness? And Ibn Umar said, not even an ounce of it. You're indebted to her for the eternity come. So this was the status that women occupied in the world of Islam. So understand now the prophecies of the Prophet. In a community where they adore their mothers, where they love their wives. You know, I'll share the story with you. There's a story from the Salaf. A lady developed a skin condition. You know, the color looked different. And being a lady, she was very sensitive to it and conscious of it. So in front of her husband, she used to feel uncomfortable. And can you imagine her trying to cover it? So this Muslim husband, who's graduated from the institution of Islam, recognized her anxiety. So a day or so later, he came to the house and pretended he's blind. I bumped my head, I can't see, my eyes have gone, I've gone blind. And for the rest of her days till she died, he pretended he's blind. No one in society knew he could see. Why? So that that one he loved and that beloved wife could not feel any discomfort in his presence. When she died, 
people came and he can see and they said, what happened? He said, I could always see, I just didn't want to make her uncomfortable. Do you see the product of Islam? This deen emancipated her, honored her, protected her. And we are guilty when you say we didn't parade her naked to, to sell a car. We didn't do that guilty. We don't want to do that. If that is honoring and revering and respecting, and we don't, we don't want it. So in this context, to this people, the Rasul makes this statement, which Brother Kamal said you've been hearing all day. It's called the Hadith of Jibreel. So, you know the story. A man came into the gathering of the Rasul, dressed very white, exclusively white had very dark hair, very dark. And the Ashab say, لا يرى عليه أثر السفر There was no sign of travel on him. You know when you travel in the desert, it's hot, you should sweat. It's dusty, you should be dusty. Um, you should be wary, it's not a five-star flight, it's, you know, nothing. لا يعرفه منا أحد so you would expect a person that well-dressed and that fresh to be local. But the Ashab say none of us knew him. So he must be a foreigner. But there's no sign of travel, mysterious. Then he comes, strange way to sit, walks straight to the Prophet, puts his knees on the knees of the Rasul. And then he puts his hands on the thighs and he says, Ya Muhammad, Sallallahu Alaihi Muhammad, Tell me about Islam. So the Prophet told him. When he finished the man said. Sadaqt. You spoke the truth. So Umar said. We are perplexed. You ask the question. And you confirm the answer. Why have you asked for? So then. Asks. Akhbirni anil iman. The Prophet answered. The man said. Sadaqt. Third. Tell me about Ihsan. The Prophet answered. The man said. True. And then he said, فَأَخْبِرْنِي عَنِ السَّاعَةِ Tell me, O Muhammad, about the Day of Judgment. So the Prophet said, I don't know any more than you. So he said, فَأَخْبِرْنِي عَنْ أَمَارَاتِهَا أَيْ عَلَامَاتِهَا Tell me its signs, its prophecies. So the Prophet said, أَنْ تَلِدَ الْأَمَةُ رَبَّتَهَا when a female servant will give birth to her master. Ibn Hajar al-Athqalani, in the Sharh of the Hadith, he says, Kathratul Uquq. This shows a prevalence of disrespect and disobedience of the parents, especially the mother. Do you understand that in the time of the Prophet, unimaginable? But he said, another time will come, my nation, where your mothers will be disrespected by their own children. And not, it will be as though she gave birth to her master. Um, as part of my research, I was watching two and a half men. You know, just the, on, on the mother section. And he comes into the room. His brother's there, the nephew's there. He says, good morning. Uh, I think the name is Al or Alan. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. Good morning, Alan. The kid's name. And then he, the mom's there. And he goes, Satan. And I'm surprised you laughed. Because mothers have become toys for kids. The one, imagine the one she, she, he, she gave birth to has grown the audacity to ridicule and mock her and to dishonor and disrespect her. 
and just yesterday he was nothing. Like it's, it's mine, but, and it would be okay if it were to happen in private. But when mass media promotes it as a culture, it is worrying. Like, what are you trying to teach, genius? What are you trying to role model? Do you think you will not reach that place yourselves? So the Prophet said, عَلَيْهِ أَفْضَلُ الصَّلَاةُ وَأَتَمُّ التَّسْلِيمُ the signs of the end of time is when she will be disrespected. One. Two. Second sign. The Rasul says, these two categories of the people of hell I haven't seen yet. I haven't seen them yet. They haven't appeared. One category refers to those that walk around with whips hitting people. And the other is with regards to women. Nisa'un kasiyatun ariyat. Women who are covered yet uncovered. You know, if you did the tafsir of this a few decades ago, you would come up with other things. But you look at fashion today, Subhan al Khaliq, clothed but unclothed. You know when this, yeah, clothed but unclothed. Sheikh Zahir Mahmoud just said that you seem to be paying for nothing. You know, the less it is, the more you pay to buy. Normally, you pay for the material. Now, the less the material they sell you, the more you want to pay for it. That tells you where the human mind has reached. So, they walk. And it leaves very little to the imagination. Yet, they're happy that they're clothed. You know, some of the swimwear, if you look at, or some of the gym wear, if you look at, they like, like, who are you? It's not clothing. Kasiyatun ariyat, clothed but naked. Or if you look a more moderate tafsir, if you like, clothing will be very tight, or it will be see-through, or there will be cuts and slits around the sides, and so on and so forth, so that although it pretends it doesn't show, it shows. And the Prophet said, "Alayhi afdalu salatu wa atamu taslim." That they will not smell the fragrance of Jannah, although it could be smelled a distance of so, you know, kada wa kada. Although the smell of Jannah can come from so far, yet these people will be made forbidden for them is that smell, that fragrance of Jannah. And you might think this will not befall us, our nation, as in the Prophet's nation. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in a hadith, the sanad of which is sahih, and it is in the musnad of Imam Ahmad in the mustadrak of Hakim. Uh, and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, towards the end of time, men from my nation will come. From the Muslims. Who will be on conveyances, on rides, mounts, which resemble the, you know, I don't know if you've seen it, uh, on the camels in the olden days, they used to have like a little hawda, like a little room they used to put for women to ride in. Like, you know, a circular dome-ish type thing, so that she's protected from around the sides and no one can see her and she can sit comfortably. So the Prophet said, it resembles that. It resembles an enclosed space. And then the next word of the hadith, it uses the word to depict the comforts of home. So it will be enclosed like the hawla, and it would have the comforts of home. A bit like your cars. 
or limousines. You know, there's drinks there, there's comfortable seating that you can lie down, you can rest normally on a horse, you couldn't. If you look at the caravans, you can go to the toilet. So, but I'm not concluding because tomorrow something else might come and it might be a better reflection of the word of the Rasul. So he says they will drive or use these kind of transportation and they will come to the masajid, to the doors of the masajid. Yet their women will be kasiyatin ariyat. The Muslims will be dressed yet undressed, covered yet uncovered. And then in the hadith that I stated previously, they will walk seductively in a way to attract attention, to arouse desires. And they will attract, as in men, and also attract as in women, in the sense that women will follow their lead. They will want to dress like that, walk like that, talk like that. You see it happening, don't you? I read research, a young girl, a young teen, sees 3,000 advertisements per day. In America. When I say advertisements, your head's thinking a TV ad. That's just one. You know, when you YouTube, you see another one on the side, it's an advertisement. When you're driving, you see billboard, it's an advertisement. A pop up comes on your screen, it's an advertisement. On your phone, it's an advertisement. So they count 3,000 times a day. It is bashed in the head of that young, innocent girl. To dress like this, walk like this, talk like this. 3,000 times a day. And can you imagine, I, I, have, a, you know, I'm, I have a school in which uh, predominantly my students are, are girls. And uh, can you imagine the pressure on that young teenage girl? Who looks at herself and looks at the billboard. Can you imagine her anxiety? The lack of confidence in herself. The amount of mental turmoil that she is going through day in, day out. Comparing herself 3,000 times to an airbrushed photo, a photoshopped picture of a model who is far away from the reality of creation. Or an exceptional case or a, a you know, small minority, and yet you superimpose that on the majority, if you look like this and if you don't buy this product, so that you can look like this and appear like this. They have snatched comfort from their lives. I saw makeup on one of my students, so I said, kiddo, uh, you need to take that off. She said, sir, I have an insecurity problem. And it's true. So these are the challenges that come towards the end of time. And the question, why the prophecies? Why did the Rasul tell you? So that number one is to increase your iman, that's a given. But second, so that you can take strategic steps to save your own. And I want to go to some solutions here, my brethren and sisters. The difficulties and challenges will keep increasing to the point where the hadith says, يأتي على الناس زمان القابض فيه على دينه كالقابض على الجمر A time will come where the one who holds on to his religion will be like the one holding on to fire or to coal. 
So that type of difficulty when you know what's coming, you have to prepare your offsprings and children and students for it. And in that regards, I wish to give an advice as an educator to those who are in education. Our education system currently across the world in its majority is an informative system. It informs you about science and maths and literacy and numeracy and so on. We need to change it to a transformative system so that it changes the personalities of those that sit in front of us to learn to become individuals much more confident, much more resilient, much more able and capable and competent and confident. So that they become winning personalities. Because otherwise they won't survive in the world of tomorrow. And you're doing them a disservice if you're not equipping them for tomorrow. And at this juncture, I also wish to point, as Muslims more than anyone else, we need to invest seriously in female education. Because whether you like it or not, she is the cornerstone of civilization. Nations are built by women, not by men. Whether Muslim or non-Muslim, they've understood this. Napoleon said, teach a woman, you teach a nation. Teach a man, you teach a person. Scientific research establishes that in the first five years of a child's life, 80% of his and her personality becomes fixed. I want to ask you, who is the hero of the child in the first five years of life? Who is the closest person to the child in the first five years of life? Who nourishes and cherishes and molds and makes the child in the first five years of life? It is the mother of that child. And if you haven't invested in her, if you haven't honored her and protected her and boosted her up and allowed her to reach her full potential, you're disadvantaging the future generation. Look at the lives of all of the Salaf. Their success predominantly is women. The famous Imam Malik, rahimahullah ta'ala, Imam Malik, do you know he wanted to be a musician? Malik wanted to be a singer. Do you know Imam Malik? I think Malaysia Shafi'i mazhabs predominantly. Naam? Imam Malik rahimahullah, was the Imam of Medina. They call him Imam of the Darul Hijra, one of the four great madahibs. The scholars used to say no one is to give fatwa when Malik is in the city. But Malik as a little child wanted to be a singer. And look at the intelligence of the lady in the desert. A, lady, a, a mother worthy the title of mothership or motherhood. She tells him, Malik, uh, singers are very good looking people usually. On the face of it, you know, you think you've ruined his, his... But just by that statement, she changed the projection of his life. And then look at her wisdom. She used to buy him the clothing of the shuyukh as a child. You know, these things. And she used to sit him on the top of the table. You know, on, on the sofra. Ah. Oh. Humanity is indebted to her, to this lady, the mother of Malik. And then she used to ask him questions which he knew. And everyone else used to pretend they don't know. Uh, 
Can, does anyone know how many raka'a is zuhur? So Malik, little Malik, say four raka'a. It's four, you know, as the Sheikh, because in the garb of the Sheikh, four raka'a. So she used to thank him and honor. So Malik's attention from music changed to deen. And the love of deen, you know, because she made him shine through that. And Muslims, don't celebrate the silliness of your children. It is the sadness of our time. When a mom makes a little girl wear a little mini dress and then goes, shake it baby, shake it. Dance sweetheart, dance. You're just setting a projection. Towards what? Or a child makes a funny joke. So the dad asks him, repeat ten times in front of ten guests. Did you want a comedian sweetheart? In those early years, every step is a strategic step. So Malik became Imam Malik. And I have Dalil that the biggest influence in the life of a child is the mother. Look at the story of Ismail alayhi salam. Brought up in the desert by a single mother. Had she, had she been less intelligent, she would have poisoned the child's head and me and you would have heard of the, you know, the sickness till Qiyamah come. You know, honey, that father of yours left and uh, it's just me and you. You know, Ibrahim alayhi salam left them in the desert. And she could have sat and chewed on that for the next few years. Your father wasn't a good man. Your father did. But no, you know when the father came back. Do you know what was his request? By the word of the Quran. I have seen in a dream. That I am sacrificing you O my son. I am slaughtering you in a dream. And this shows the awesomeness of his upbringing and the skills of his mother and the guidance of God that the young lad who's grown up without seeing his dad says, Ya Abati, my dear father, if ma tu'mar, do as you have been commanded, satajiduni, you will find me, insha'Allah, from those who are patient. Who who taught Ismail manners like that? At very difficult circumstances. Where she should have been bitter. She should have been hurt. She should have been damaged. She should have been whinging and whining. But no, there's a great, the, the plan of Allah is at stake. And again from the household of a prophet, I will give you an example. When the wife is inadequate and unable and misguided, the son of a prophet becomes a kafir. ضَرَبَ اللَّهُ مَثَلًا لِلَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا امْرَأَةَ نُوحٍ وَامْرَأَةَ لُوطٍ كَانَتَا تَحْتَ عَبْدَيْنِ مِنْ عِبَادِنَا صَالِحَيْنِ فَخَانَتَاهُمَا فَلَمْ يُغْنِيَا عَنْهُمَا مِنَ اللَّهِ شَيْئًا And Allah gives you examples of disbelieving women like the wife of Nuh and the wife of Lut. So the wife of a prophet disbelieved and caused the son and the offspring of a prophet to become a kafir and misguided. Do you see that you need to invest in your daughters and in your sisters and in your wives so that they shine at optimum capacity because they are what make nations and generations. And my dear sisters and brothers, I will end with this. There is a million different achievements 
and accolades man can boast about. You know, I am the first one that landed on the moon. I have a billion dollars. I have become, you know, the vice chancellor of an institution. All those are achievements and Allah bless it for you. But the achievement that the Prophet says will benefit you after death is a righteous offspring. وَوَلَدٌ صَالِحًا يَدْعُوا لَهُ And a righteous offspring who will make dua for you. So may Allah Rabbul Izzah grant me and you the capacity to invest and do what is right for our next generation and especially our, our girls. And uh, may Allah Rabbul Izzah grant them the capacity to bear the mantle that is about to befall them. And may Allah Rabbul Izzah make mine and your burdens light. And may Allah Rabbul Izzah bless you and your families and your country. It has been a pleasure to be with you. May Allah protect you, guide you and guard you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh.